everyone. Good to be here this morning. So let's, let's just, before we do anything, let's just pray. Lord, we just thank you that we can be together in your house and in your name. And Lord, we ask that you would come, that you would bless us with your presence, that you would touch us, Lord, that you would make, let your word speak to us, be real in this place, let your presence be felt. Speak to us, challenge us, and Lord, as we praise you and as we worship you, set us free in your presence, Lord, that we might give you our very best. So come, Lord, we pray, let all of us go away from the we can into this place this morning. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
down the down the down the seat before we start. What time? No, I was just uh, I was just thinking. Who do you think's the strongest between you and me? Well, me, obviously. I might be small, but small things come in big packages. Oh, well, we'll try it because I think it's me. Who thinks it's Janice is the strongest? Who <laughs> thinks it's me? <laughs> right, there's only one way to prove this. We're going to do a tug of war. Oh, look at you. Oh, we're not the best of friends. I love you with that. But today, we're going to see how God proved his strength, how God proved his might and his power. You'll know that we've started and we're doing about the story of Moses. And you probably remember last week, Moses had lots and lots of excuses, lots of reasons why he didn't want to do what God asked him to do. And one by one, God removed all of his excuses. And so eventually, Moses did go, with Aaron's help, went to speak to the people. And he told the people about God's rescue plan and they believed him and they worshipped God. So now this week, Moses has to be really brave, do what God really wanted him to do, and with Aaron's help, he goes to speak to Pharaoh. And he tells Pharaoh, you know, I've come today because God has been speaking to me. God has told me that he is going to let all of the people go away from you cruel Egyptians God is going to give all his people, the Israelites, a new and better land where there's room for all of them, men, women, children, and all of their flocks. There's going to be enough grazing for the animals and there's going to be enough food for everyone. So God has sent me here today, Pharaoh, to tell you, you must let God's people go. Well, Pharaoh didn't believe anything that Moses said. He didn't know who this God was. He didn't believe in him anyway, even if he did know. And he said, I just think you're trying to be lazy. The people just don't want to do any work and you're trying to get me to let them go away. No, I'm not going to let them go. And in fact, I'm going to work, make them work even harder. So the people came and complained to Moses. And then Moses went and complained to God. And he said, God, you told me, you promised that you were going to rescue your people. But all that's happened is Pharaoh's got angry, Pharaoh's making them work even harder, and you haven't rescued us at all. But God said, wait, trust me, I will prove my strength, my power, and I will show my might. Pharaoh might not believe right away, but one day he will, and all the Egyptians will say that I am God. Lord of all. But when, when Moses asked Pharaoh to let his people go, Pharaoh said, no. And God said, I will I'm going to send. Slick as ever. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to send a plague of blood and there'll be rivers and lakes and ponds and streams. It'll just be yucky blood. And even the pots and the jars in your house will be blood and you won't be able to get a drink. And all the fish died and it was smelly. And Pharaoh turned and went into his palace and he didn't care. So, seven days later, God sent another plague. This time it was a plague of frogs. Now, not just one tiny pink frog hopping about the garden. There were thousands of frogs. They were everywhere. They were in the streets. They were in their homes. They were downstairs, they were upstairs, they were in the bedrooms. And after church, that's clear what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> there were frogs everywhere. You couldn't move for frogs. This time, Pharaoh called Moses. And he said, Moses, please pray to God. Ask him to take all these horrible frogs away. Then I'll let the people go. So Moses prayed. The frogs disappeared. Pharaoh looked around, there wasn't a frog in sight. Did he keep his promise? No, he didn't. So next, God sent a plague of gnats. And these were horrible, nasty little insects, like midges really. And there were swarms of them, and they were everywhere. And anywhere you went in the fields, or when you were doing your work, 
These were everywhere and they were biting and stinging and they were horrible. And Pharaoh's friends said to him, surely this is God punishing you. But Pharaoh would not listen. So next, God sent a plague of flies. But this time, the flies only affected the Egyptians. The Israelites didn't have a single fly in their houses, but the Egyptians' houses were full of flies. They were everywhere. They were downstairs, upstairs, in the kitchen, in the pots, in the pans, on the food, on the people. They were just everywhere. The whole ground and floors of all their houses were covered in flies. Once again, Pharaoh came to Moses and he said, Moses, please pray to God. Ask him to take these flies away and I promise I will let your people go. Moses said, well, this time you better keep your promise. So once again, Moses prayed. The flies disappeared. Did Pharaoh keep his promise? No. So next, Moses warned Pharaoh and said, if you continue to refuse, God's going to strike down all your livestock, all your cattle and your horses and your camels. And the next day, the officials went to check and all the Egyptian animals were dead. But the Israelites, all their animals were fine. But still, Pharaoh refused. So God sent a plague of boils, nasty blisters, sores all over their skin. But did Pharaoh listen? No. And next, there was heel. Giant huge heel stones. <laughs> and the crops were flattened. But still, Pharaoh said, no. My God told Moses, I've been there, I'm showing all these signs to prove my strength, to prove my power to the Egyptians, but also as a sign to the Israelites, so that you can also be sure that I am God, I am Lord of all. Now Moses said to Pharaoh, if you continue to refuse to let God's people go, I'm going to send a plague of locusts. Pharaoh's officials pleaded with him. They said, Pharaoh, can't you see? Our livestock is dead. Our crops have been flattened by the hail. Our land is ruined. Now there's going to be locusts. And they will strip the crops of everything that is left. Now Pharaoh said, okay. But just a minute. Only the men can go. Well, that's not what God said. So God sent his plague of locusts. Pharaoh realized that he had done wrong. And he said to him, Moses, please forgive me. And ask your God to forgive me too. I'm so sorry. Well, yeah, I can tell him to take these sticky locusts away as well. So, once again, Moses prayed. The locusts disappeared. There wasn't a trace of any of them left. Was Pharaoh really sorry? Did he let the people go? No. So now, God sent darkness. Dark, dark, darker than you could ever imagine. And the Egyptians couldn't see a thing, but the Israelites, they could see everything. That was, wasn't a problem for them, but the Egyptians couldn't do anything, couldn't go anywhere. It was just too dark. And Pharaoh said, okay, take the men and the women, but leave your flocks. And Moses said, no way, that's not what God has said. And Pharaoh said, get out of my sight, don't come back and ask me again, and if I see you again, I'm going to kill you. Well, I'll never be back then, Moses said. But God said to Moses, I have one more plea. One more thing I'm going to do to prove my power and my strength. The next thing that I do, Pharaoh will listen. But that is the story for next week. So we, next week we'll find out what else God had in mind. And will Pharaoh really listen this time? Will he change his mind? Will he let the people go? Well, like I said, that's for next week. So what can we learn from this week? Well. Pharaoh had a message directly from God. God said, let my people go. First of all, Pharaoh said no. And it's a bad idea to say no to God. But then Pharaoh tried to make a deal. He tried to do it a little bit. He tried to say, well, okay, I'll just let the men go. That wasn't what God wanted. God was not pleased. Then he said, well, okay, let the men and the women go. But again, that's not what God wanted. God had given him a direct order to let all his people go. And there's something that we can learn from that. Because God has a rescue plan for us. And God has one thing that we need to do to be rescued from our lives of sin. God has promised us a new life. 
a new life free of sin and a perfect life in heaven. But there's only one way that we can get there. And that's by asking Jesus into our heart to live for him. Some people don't believe in God. Some people just say, no, not for me. Just like Pharaoh did. Some people say, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just be very good. I'll be very, very good. And then God will let me go to heaven. But that isn't God's plan. That's not what God said. Some people say, well, I'll go to church every week. And I'll read my Bible now and again. And some, if I remember, I'll say my prayers. But again, that's not what God said. God said, there's one way to get to heaven. And it's only through his son, Jesus, who died for us. That's what we can learn from this story today. So now we're going to sing. We're going to sing, our God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing our God cannot do. Do you remember the actions? Hope you do. I'll be copying you. <laughs>
You know, once again, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to be able to break bread together and just to take time and pause and think about what it really meant for Jesus Christ to come down from heaven to earth and endure humiliation for those that he created, those that were born, those that were born to worship him and yet reject him. And he came to earth and humbled himself and endured everything, everything, being despised and rejected and humiliated and went through it all that he could be my saviour and he could be your saviour. And he did it so that we could be his family, his church, and we can be with him in heaven forever. There was no, no other way. And so it's a privilege this morning that as we break bread, that we can do this. We can do it openly, and we can publicly declare that the price has been paid for our salvation. But it's not just a case of declaring, it's a case of appreciating all over again. And Jesus knows he knows we can get caught up in the busyness of everyday life. So he take just a few minutes out and just remember afresh, as he's called us to. So we just thank you for that, Lord. So let's, let's just take a few moments and please feel free to give thanks just quietly or publicly um, and just to meditate on the cross and then we'll be together. Jesus Christ for my sin, Lord. Just thank you for that great love of your heart. It's true of what you have all praise, Lord. And we recognize that tonight, Lord. Mary recognizes. Centurion recognizes more than we recognize that you are the only God, Lord. You're worthy of praise, Lord. And I just thank you for your salvation, your free salvation, Lord. You never realize really how much it costs. Not the price for sin, Lord, that ugliness of sin, Lord, that has marred this human race, Lord. We just praise and thank you from our hearts that you can and take that price for us. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord, we just thank you for the cross. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you for going the whole way for us to make the only price possible. And Lord, this morning, as we remember your death and your sacrifice for us, Lord, we pray that you would bless this bread and bless this wine. And Lord, we just thank you that you did it, not because you were forced to, but you did it purely because you loved us. And oh God, I pray that that love would humble us beyond measure this morning. 
as we appreciate all over again the depths and the wonders of our salvation. So bless this bread and bless this wine in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Okay, let's play. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the truth that's in your word. Lord, we thank you that your word is dependable. Your word is sure. Your word is steadfast. Your word never changes. And oh God, we just thank you for your presence among us. Lord, we pray that you would open, open your word to us. Lord, give us ears to hear it, hearts to understand it. And let us take it in. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so last week we looked at how Jesus was fully God and yet uh, he became fully man to provide us with the only way that we could be forgiven. There was no other way. And the Bible says, we looked at it, Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. So last week we looked at how Jesus um, created the heavens and the earth. It says about Jesus, there was nothing made that was made. He was involved at the very centre of creation. And we look to see in the book of Revelation when we see Jesus coming on a white horse leading the armies of heaven to defeat Satan once and for all and to reign forever as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And yet we also saw um, in Psalm, uh, sorry not in Psalm, but in Isaiah 53, we see the picture of the humility of Jesus as he came to the earth with us, for us. And that is all to see of Jesus. So, um, this week we're going to look at what Jesus actually preached. Can you imagine what a Jesus sermon would actually be like? We'd probably be a lot better than mine, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and yet he said his sermon was strange that's recorded. So the Sermon on the Mount, I think, is the first sermon that's recorded um, that Jesus actually preached. It tells us what he did before in the Bible, but then we come to when he actually sits down and he actually speaks to the people at length. And for a bit of context for this, John had already declared him to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He'd been baptized, this is Jesus, he'd been baptized with water, he'd been filled with the Holy Spirit, and he'd been confirmed by God the Father as a voice from heaven. And he went up into the mountains for 40 days and he fasted and prayed and sought God to be empowered and enabled for the ministry that was lying ahead of him. He withstood the temptations of Satan to take shortcuts. He said, you can have all the glory. Just, just, just worship me. You don't have to go through all of this. Forget Calvary and the cross. Just worship me. Let, just treat me as, as somebody and, and give me a position. And you don't have to go through this. I can give you all the glory of earth. And Jesus withstood that. So he was put up, full of the power of the Holy Spirit and he called his twelve disciples and it said he began preaching and teaching and healing people everywhere. And then we come to Matthew 5. And it says, now when Jesus saw the crowd, so this is Matthew 5, we'll give a chance to find it. Uh, and a head start. So Matthew chapter 5, and from verse 1. Matthew 5. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went on a mount, up on a mountainside and sat down, and his disciples came to him, and they began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people shall insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who went before you. And there's lots and lots more to the Sermon on the Mount. We'll be here until like Thursday, I think, if I was to read it all and speak it on and on. But this is the, this is the bit that I was drawn to. And bear in mind at this point that the Jewish religion was all about outward observance. You, you had to be seen to be given a tenth, even a tenth of the herbs you grew, a tenth of your crops, and you couldn't, you, know, you couldn't walk any more than so many steps on Sunday, and you had to go to the temple on appointed days. But it was all outward observance. It didn't matter what was going on inside your heart. As long as you did the right things when you were supposed to, um, then, then you were okay. And also, and it wasn't just it wasn't just the Jewish people at the time of Jesus, but all through the Old Testament. 
being rich, having thousands upon thousands of sheep and camels and goats, was not just a sign of richness, but it was seen as a sign of God's great blessing. So if God was blessing you, you could see it in a material fashion. Um, and you thought that Jesus, being full of the power of the Holy Ghost, would have come preaching a really strong message to them. And the people were probably expecting that he was going to be saying, let's, let's rise up, let's chase the Romans out of our land, let's establish ourselves again like it was in the days of David, and let's um, chase all our neighbours and subdue them all, and let us be seen to be the powerful, all-conquering nation of Israel um, that God is behind. And Jesus' message couldn't have been any different from that. Because it's very, with his very first words that we read there, he wasn't saying, be strong and, and serve God with all your heart and rise up and follow me and don't be afraid and fear not. And he said many of those things in other contexts, but it's actually a very gentle, humble message that he starts with. And because basically, um, the challenge of Jesus here was, he said, if your hearts and your motives don't match your, your actions, you're a hypocrite, and you'll be rejected by God. And that was a very strong message, and it was very unacceptable to the religious leaders and teachers who basically said, if you do this, and you do this, and you do this, then you're, you know, this means that you belong to us, and this means you inherit all the promises that we're talking about. You'll be saved by just following and doing. But there was no mention there of where their hearts were. Whereas Jesus was saying, look, your heart is what matters, and it's what's on the inside that matters. And it's just like we, as uh, in 1 Samuel 16, uh, when it says, when it's talking about Samuel is trying to pick David, and he's saying, look, oh, look, here's the son here. Is this the one that God's going to pick to be king? Is this the one that God's going to be picked? Is this the one that God's going to pick? And it says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. Rejected and this is the key bit. But the Lord does not look on the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And Jesus' whole message was going to the very heart and what was happening inside. Um, and also, we see as well that he wasn't preaching this prosperity gospel. You know, if you serve God, God's going to absolutely bless you with money and with sheep and with goats and with cars and with the bank account and all the rest of it. He was, he was saying, look, your reward, and he mentions it several times here, he says your reward isn't here, it isn't down here, it doesn't matter if you have nothing. If you come to me with nothing, you might still have nothing, but your reward is in heaven. And that is quite difficult. If people's whole, um, if the thing that drives people is for success, and wealth, and riches, and prestige, and suddenly Jesus says, none of that matters. This doesn't matter at all. What goes on down here doesn't count for anything. It's what happens in eternity. It's what happens in heaven that counts. And so this was the message they had to, uh, to them. And the other thing is, we read about Matthew talks about the kingdom of heaven. Some of the other, some of the other uh, gospels talk about the kingdom of God. But I believe these are one and the same thing. And what it really means is it's living coming under the Lordship of Jesus and it's receiving his promise of eternal life and his salvation, being part of God's family and being in full and complete right relationship with God and not being separated by sin. So he had mentioned here, well, we've got it here, you poor in heaven, poor in spirit, will receive the kingdom of God. Some of these other, uh, other uh, people that he had said would receive the kingdom of God. But we know that we can't experience or receive the kingdom of heaven until we're saved and we're born again. And we'll also look at that. Um, but let's have a look at the nine types of people that God promises to bless here. And he shows that through their weakness, God will make them strong and they'll receive what the world thinks is impossible. So the things that the world is striving after, or even the religious people order of the day was striving after and weren't going to meet. God is telling us these are the type of people that will be blessed. Um, so first of all, let's just quickly, I don't want to spend too long on it, but let's look at the different categories that it talks about here. So there's the poor in spirit. Being poor in spirit um, means these are humble people. 
who recognize there's nothing within them. There's nothing within them that's really, that accounts to much. They see they have nothing except what God gives them. And that's what being poor in spirit is, being humble and realizing that there's nothing good within us. Our goodness and our dependency and our strength comes from God. And then he talks about those, and it says, this is the reward for these people who feel they have nothing. It says they will receive the kingdom of heaven. And it says, then goes on, then say, those who mourn will be comforted. That's not, I don't believe God is calling us to be miserable. We don't read about a miserable Jesus. We read about a, a Jesus that was full of joy. And says, with my joy that's bubbling out of me, I'm going to give this to you. So we don't, we're not called to be miserable and go around with long faces and whatever. But all of us go through times that are difficult. And all of us go through those times that just are hard. And he says, look, don't worry. If you're going through one of those times, you will be comforted. God will comfort you. And I'm going to look at the meek who will inherit the earth. The meek doesn't necessarily mean the weak. The weak have no say in it. If somebody is weak, they have no strength. But if somebody is meek, what they're saying is, I'm not going to use whatever strength I've got. But, um, but they're saying, I'm not going to stand up and fight back. I'm not going to stand up and demand my rights. I'm not going to be proud and arrogant and say, do you not know who I am? Being me just says, even though I could do those things, I choose not to. And it says, yet, you would think that was the people that were least likely to inherit anything. And Jesus said, you're going to inherit the earth. You're the ones going to inherit the earth. And then this I love. It says, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. God promises and says, if we want to be hungry, if we hunger and desire to be filled with God, He will fill us. It's an absolute promise that He has because that's that's who God loves. Those that recognize there's no pride, there's no arrogance, there's a humility. We want uh, to be, we want to know God, and it says we will be filled. And the merciful will be shown mercy. Um, God is a God of mercy and he loves to be merciful and he loves to see us use that. He doesn't want us to say be harsh and judgmental and hate our enemies and say, oh, he deserves that. He deserves that. Give him every... There's so many um, parables and messages from Jesus on this very subject. But God loves mercy and God wants us to be merciful. Um, and then we come to the pure in heart. And that's a deep inward purity, and it speaks of holiness. And none of us can achieve that holiness by ourselves, but it speaks of a desire for God, a desire to please Him with pure heart and pure motives. And what does it say about those of, that are pure in heart? It says, they will see God. So the promise is here. If you think of the promise is here, you'll be shown mercy, you'll inherit the earth, you'll be comforted, you'll see the kingdom of God. You'll be filled with God and His righteousness and you'll see God. And then, similar to the merciful, it's the peacemakers. It's the people who bring peace. Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus came to bring peace. Um, and then, um, he, warns, he warns the people and says, look, this isn't going to be easy. This wasn't just a, oh, just be nice to people, just be meek and mild and humble and you'll be great. He says, if you're persecuted, he said, in fact, he says, you will be persecuted because of righteousness, but you'll receive the kingdom of heaven. Um, and it says, when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, it says, great is your reward in heaven. And it may be that you get much reward down here. And if we're looking for fame and acclaim and people say, oh, he's brilliant, he really suffered, he did this, Jesus is saying that doesn't matter because we're not looking for what happens down here. We are looking, our eyes need to be fixed on heaven. And it's a complete change of perspective uh, that we're looking for. Um, because Jesus is calling us to fix our minds and our attention on heavenly things, not earthly things. He says, look, your Father knows that you need these things. Trust your Father to look after you here, but make sure your focus and your attention is on heaven, because that's where you're called to be. Um, and just to recap there on just some of those promises. It says, these are amazing promises. It says, we will be filled. 
and we hunger and thirst for righteousness. We will see God for pure in heart, we've got right motives. We will receive mercy if we show mercy. We'll be comforted if we mourn. We'll be accepted into heaven if we are meek and humble or poor in spirit and take a stand for what is right. And we will have a great reward in heaven if we endure persecution. And our goal, obviously, as Christians, is to be like Jesus. He demonstrated all of these things. He didn't just come and preach a message and said, do this. He demonstrated it perfectly and fully in his life. But, what that really is with us, I mean, this is great if somebody is, can pick every box here to say they're pure in heart, they're, they're full of mercy, they're always meek, they're always um, and poor spirit, they're never proud, they're never arrogant, they're never angry, they never get cross. The Bible says they fall in, and we've all fallen short. And um, and there's no way, humanly speaking, that we could constantly hunger and thirst after God to the level we need to by ourselves. We couldn't do it by our own effort. We couldn't make our hearts pure because we've sinned, and sin will always support every attempt that we have just to make ourselves better people. Um, and so, so why did Jesus teach the people about what it would mean to be blessed and experience the full blessing of heaven and to see God and to receive his mercy and his blessing and have a great reward of heaven if there was no way we could ever measure up to it? And the answer is in John 3, verse 3, um, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he says, very, very, I tell you, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again, as we know. So Jesus is saying, this is how you get blessed. This is what it means to live in the kingdom and live under the blessing and anointing of God. And this is where your reward is. And, but yet, you can't do it on your own strength. You have to completely surrender to me and be born again. Because we can only do it as new creations. But as the new creations, that is how he calls us to be, and that's why he lays it out. And just um, finally, I just want to look in Psalm 51. So if you want to turn to Psalm 51. And Psalm 51 was written by David. And David had sinned and blown it. And he knew he had. He knew he had completely failed. This was a man that the Bible described as a man after God's own heart. This was a man who really deeply knew God, knew what pleased God, wanted to live his entire life to please God, and yet he sinned and failed spectacularly. He committed adultery, he committed murder, um, and he completely blacked God out, and then he realised, have I just gone too far? Have I gone too far? And Psalm 51 is the psalm that he wrote when he pleads with God. And so we'll pick it up, I would love to read the whole psalm, but um, just let's jump in at verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And verse 17, my sacrifice to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, O God, will not despise. So he's displaying the very qualities that Jesus spoke about in the Sermon on the Mount. He knew that there was nothing to do within himself, but he knew what was expected of him. And he said, God, I can't do it, but you create in me that pure heart. And so, we see this is how we obtain the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. We come humbly before Jesus and we recognise that we're poor in spirit and we ask him to change us as we commit our lives to him. We're not just cleaned up, we're not just given a quick facelift, a quick, a quick lift, just to keep us, just to make us a bit better than we were. We have to be completely born again, transformed, made new, and, and we need to then be more like Jesus. And then we will start to experience the blessings. Because the message that Jesus came came with was it's all about what goes on in your heart. God looks in our heart. It's not about your record actions. It's not about how religious you are. It's not about how much you tie. It's not this balancing thing. Do all my good deeds outweigh my sin. Because no matter what set of skills you have, 
sin will always outweigh everything we try to do on our own efforts. So Jesus came and said, this is what I've come to proclaim. This kingdom of heaven that you can be part of, but you need to surrender to me. Let me remake you. Let me give you a clean, pure heart. And you will see God. And you'll know the mercy of God, and the blessing of God, and the richness of God. I just wonder this morning, if there's anybody who feels in that same position. Either you've been trying to do this by yourself and you realise, God, I've never fully, never fully surrendered and committed to you. It just doesn't work me doing it by myself. God, I want you to come in. And I want to surrender my life to you. Or maybe you're a Christian and somehow, just with the busyness of life and the struggles and everything that comes along, you maybe lost sight of how Jesus wants us to be. And you realise that you don't have you know, a little bit of pride there, there's arrogance, there's trying to do things with your own strength. Maybe that humility is gone. Maybe you try to think that you don't believe in Jesus quite as much as, as um, really you do. But this morning, I just hope that everyone has that desire to be completely, fully surrendered to Jesus, that he would give us that pure heart with us, a pure spirit that would be focused on heaven and not on earth, and that he would be the full uh, center of our attention and the recipient of our worship. So this morning, let's just close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you come. Lord, you didn't come with a harsh message. You came with a gentle message, and yet it was a radical message. And this morning, Lord, it's our, des- it's our desire that every one of us would be fully yielded, fully surrendered to you. Lord, that we would seek you first. Lord, let you create in us a pure heart. Let you do your new work of creation within us. And Lord, that we would know the blessing and the salvation of heaven. Lord, we just thank you for it. Amen.
announcements. Next Sunday night, uh, next Sunday morning, we have Kenny McClatchy back preaching with us. Next Sunday night, we have Nigel and Julie, um, and they'll be doing a healthy um, com um, concert here tonight for us and, uh, and sharing with us as well. Um, so it'll be, it'll be something different and it'll be something good, and there's been a lot of interest in it, and it'll be good to see people come in for that. And um, next Sunday morning also will be um, we'll be um, collecting for the food bank. So if you bring some non-perishable foods, and um, we'll have a box at the back next Sunday morning. Okay. So before we close, or as we close in prayer, um, I want to pray for anybody that wants prayer for for sick. Um, we will pray generally. We won't call people out. But if anybody who wants to be anointed with oil, I'll come down to the back and do it quietly, just like we did last week. So. That's fine, and we'll pray for Leslie. Uh, again, I'm speaking to Leslie, and we have uh, taken ill yesterday. I think that I mean, it happens almost every week. He has an attack or a turn, and it really keeps him from being here, and it's really frustrating. But I promised him that we would pray for him. So, yes, we'll pray for your, your family, and we'll pray for Leslie. Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we can meet in your presence. Lord, we thank you for being here with us this morning. We thank you for touching us as we praise you and as we worship you. We thank you for your word. And oh Lord, we just pray for these, for these needy people. Lord, we pray for Leslie. Lord, I pray that you would stay, the, stay these attacks. Lord, even that they wouldn't happen at weekends. And I pray that you would be able to come into fellowship and receive prayer and fellowship and blessing in your presence. Lord, we just uphold them before you and ask that you would strengthen them. Lord, that you would stay the hand of the enemy with all these attacks. And Lord, that you would bring them through to a measure of health and strength in you, in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray for Rosie's family in England, this bereavement. And we pray that you would be a comfort. Lord, that you would bless them. Lord, you would strengthen them. And they would know your peace and your blessing at this difficult time. Lord, we pray for all of us, all of our families. All of our families of people that need you. And I pray that you would move in our families. You would cause us to be effective witnesses in our families. And Lord, that we would see mighty things done through the name of Jesus in this place. Amen.